And now I'm going to give you some great shortcuts to make electron configuration and orbital diagram even easier. We're going to do this using our periodic table. So you'll want to have a periodic table as you're following along with me. The main idea here is that our periodic table, although the person that invented it didn't realize it, is naturally divided into blocks. And we are going to label those right now. You may want some different colored pens or pencils for this next part. I'm going to highlight that S block of elements and I'm going to do this in green on my periodic table. These elements that I just put a line around make up the S block of elements. You'll notice there seems to be a gap in this S block right here at the top. Well, let's fill that in. The element that would fit very nicely in this gap just so happens to be written on this other side of our periodic table and that would be helium. Helium and all the rest of these elements in the first two columns make up the S block. The next thing I'll label are the P block elements and the P block elements are found in this part of the periodic table. Even though elements 113 through 118 are not on my table, I'm going to go ahead and make room for them. These elements here make up what we call the P block elements. Even though the discoverer of the periodic table didn't notice this, we see an interesting pattern here. How many columns of elements are there in the S block? How many columns are there? Looks like there's two columns of S block elements. What about the P block? How many columns make up the P block of elements? Well, it looks like there's six columns in the P block. Gee, I wonder how many columns we're going to find when we draw the D block. Here is the D block of elements. And notice how many columns of elements we just boxed. It looks like there are ten columns in the D block. The last group of elements are known as the F block elements and they're the only ones that remain. These elements are actually misplaced on our periodic table. And if you look closely at atomic number you can see how these are misplaced. The correct position for these elements is actually up a little bit higher in our periodic table and they would fit really nicely in this gap that I'm highlighting. The problem is we didn't want a periodic table that wouldn't fit on a piece of paper. So those elements have been removed and placed at the bottom of your table, but they technically fit in just above in a little gap. All right, so I'm going to label these my F block elements. Without counting them, I want to see if you can guess how many columns of elements make up the F block. You are sharp. All right, this is looking pretty interesting, this periodic table. But wait, it gets even better. Check this out. The first row of the S block of elements could actually be called the 1S row of elements. And the second row, we could label the 2S elements. The third row on this periodic table makes up 3S, and on down we go. We could do something similar for the P block. The first row of the P block is not the 1P row. The first row of the P block is the 2P row. And the 3P and the 4P, 5P, 6P, and 7P elements. I'm going to do the same for the D block, but be careful. A lot of students get confused at the label for this. The first row of the D block is not the 1D. There is no 1D sublevel nor is it a 2D. The first row of the D block is called the 3D. And you can see why students mess this up. It doesn't seem to match. The rest of these elements are in a row that we're calling the 4S and the 4P, and yet here we have the 3D. Well, that is correct. That is the 3D row, and the 4D, and the 5D, and the 6D row. Finally, I want to label the F block elements. Now again, we're looking for patterns here. Did you notice that the first row of the S block was labeled 1S and the first row of the P block was labeled 2P? The D block was 3D. So what do you think the first row of the F block would be? 
Right, it's the 4F. This is a good looking periodic table. Now, we're going to head back and do some example problems using the new information that we placed on our periodic table. Let's see if it's a little easier to do the electron configurations for potassium, bromine, and rhodium. So here's potassium, element number 19. Here is bromine, element number 35. And then here's element number 45, rhodium. For potassium, I'll begin by writing its symbol and the number of electrons I want. Now, I'm going to write in the electron configuration for potassium, beginning with the 1s, then the 2s, and the 2p, and continue until I have enough places for all 19 electrons. This is the electron configuration for potassium. Notice how this electron configuration ends. This configuration ends with the 4s1. Now, take a look at the position of the element potassium on our periodic table. It's right here in the 4s block. And not only that, it is the first element in the 4s block. Thus, its configuration ends 4s1. Let's try another configuration. This one for bromine, element number 35. Notice that the electron configuration for bromine ends with a 4p5. Now, look at where bromine is on our periodic table. Bromine is in the 4p row, and not only that, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 elements over. And so, again, it's not a coincidence, bromine's electron configuration is going to end 4p5. In our next example, we're going to draw the electron configuration for rhodium. Rhodium is element number 45. Before I draw this, let's see if you can predict how this electron configuration will end. What will be the last sublevel and the last superscript number that I draw for that sublevel? While you're thinking about it, I'm going to draw my configuration. The electron configuration for rhodium ends with a 4d7. And you already predicted that if you looked on your periodic table at the position of rhodium. It is the seventh element in the 4d row of our periodic table. This is pretty cool, but wait, it gets even better. Don't know if you could tell from my abbreviations, but we're going to be using abbreviated electron configuration to make these even easier. Let me see if I can explain how you abbreviate the electron configuration. I'm going to draw the electron configurations for a few elements that I happen to remember. Neon has 10 electrons. So when I draw its configuration, I write 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. If I were going to do this for sodium, sodium has 11 electrons. So I would write all the same thing, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 but one additional electron, which would go in the 3s sublevel. Now, let's try aluminum. Aluminum has a few more electrons. It's got 13 electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. With abbreviated electron configuration, we realize we're starting our configurations the same way every time. Can't we make this easier? The answer is yes, we can, but there are some rules to this. Notice that in this first electron configuration, I wrote 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and that appears again in this configuration as well as this configuration. What we're going to do is we're going to take out this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and we're going to substitute it with something. Since that is exactly what we wrote up here for neon, we're just going to plug in neon in square brackets, and we'll just pick up our configuration for that from there. We'll do the same thing for our aluminum electron configuration. I just erased 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and I replace it with the symbol for neon in square brackets. So there are some rules for how we abbreviate. Let me show you the rules for abbreviated configuration. The first rule says that you always abbreviate from a noble gas. 
a noble gas on the periodic table is one of those elements that appears on the far right hand side. Let me show you the noble gases on the periodic table. This group of elements right here is a family that we call the noble gases. So when you're abbreviating your electron configurations, make sure that you always start with one of those, the noble gases. The second thing you have to remember, after you've written the noble gases, pick up your electron configuration from where you left off. In other words, you don't start over with a 1s. That has already been represented by the element that you put in brackets. You pick up with your remaining electrons in the sublevels where they are found. Let's try some of these abbreviated electron configurations. In this problem, we're going to write an abbreviated electron configuration for palladium, for borium, and for radon. Palladium is element number 46. I don't want to write out 46 electrons for the configuration of palladium. Borium is element number 107. That's even longer. Radon is element number 86 on my periodic table. All three of these have long electron configurations, but we're not concerned because we're going to be abbreviating. So to do the electron configuration of palladium, element number 46, I'm just going to look backward to the last noble gas that came before element 46, which would have been element 36, krypton. That is the element that I will use to abbreviate my electron configuration. Now krypton has 36 electrons. By writing krypton symbol, what I've done is I've represented the first 36 electrons in all the sublevels where krypton's electrons are found. Now I just pick up elements 37, 38, and work my way over to palladium. So I will represent the electrons in the 5s sublevel, 5s2, and the electrons in the 4d sublevel, and it looks like this would have a 4d8. Not 48, 4d8. How do we check to see if we did this correctly? Previously, we just added up all of the superscripts, but that's not going to work here. That only adds up to 10. Well, keep in mind, krypton has 36 of its own electrons. So if you add up these superscripts, 36 plus 2 plus 8, that will give us 46. Perfect. Let's try borium next. For borium, I'm going to do the same thing and look backward until I find the previous noble gas, which was radon. Then I'm going to represent radon in the square brackets Rn. From here, I'll pick up with the next sublevel that fills. And the next sublevel after radon would be the 7s sublevel. Now be careful, after the 7s, we don't get into the 6d. You have to recall that there is a gap written right here on our periodic table that should be filled in with this whole block of elements down here. It's easiest if you follow the numbers, number 87, number 88, and then we're down to number 89. Following the Rn in brackets, we write 7s2, and then we write 5f14, and following that, 6d5. That's the abbreviated electron configuration for borium. Finally, the last example we're going to do this with is radon. What some of my students like to do with radon is they like to abbreviate radon this way. You can probably see why this doesn't work. This doesn't tell us anything about the electron structure in radon. The electrons for radon look just like the electrons in radon. Well, that's not going to work. We need to go to the last noble gas, the previous noble gas, before radon. In other words, I'm going to work my way backward all the way through the periodic table to xenon, the last noble gas, and that's what I'm going to abbreviate. We pick up the configurations from xenon. We move on to the 6s2, and then the 4f. Don't forget the gap. Mind the gap. 4f holds 14 electrons. Following that would be the 5d sublevel, which holds 10. And then finally, we work our way over to the 6p sublevel, which has a capacity of 6 electrons. And since radon is the last element in that row, it's going to be full, 6p6. This is how we do abbreviated electron configurations. Aren't these so much easier now that we have a labeled periodic table and we know that we can abbreviate the last noble gas? You don't need to answer that. For the last topic, I need to let you know that there are some exceptions to this. We've learned the rules and you're probably going to be able to apply them, 
but occasionally you're going to see elements that don't follow the rules. There are two that I want to highlight, and the first one is copper. You see, copper doesn't fill its 4s sublevel before adding to the 3d. So the electron configuration looks like this. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. How come they didn't fill that up? Well, there is a reason, and we don't need to get into the details, but let me see if I can explain that a little bit with an orbital diagram. Copper has 29 electrons, and I've already represented the first 18 of them. So let me show you where the last electrons go. This is how we normally would draw orbital diagram for copper. However, here's the exception. One of the electrons in the 4s sublevel is going to move. I'm going to move this electron over to the 3d sublevel. Why does copper do this? Well, if you notice on our orbital diagram, the energy for the 3d and the 4s is really not that different. Pretty close to the same. And because of the way that we're squeezing electrons into a 4s sublevel, they're a little happier just by moving one of the electrons up so that it can be in a less crowded space. We see something similar with chromium. Chromium also doesn't fill up its 4s sublevel before adding electrons into the 3d sublevel. So the electron configuration for chromium also looks a little odd. Notice the 4s sublevel once again only has one electron. There are other elements that do this too. And if you ever look at a list of electron configurations, you'll see several elements whose electron configuration looks a little odd. Gold, for example, also has an unfilled S sublevel, even though there are electrons in higher energy sublevels for gold. Well, this concludes our study of electron configuration and orbital diagram. You've got all the tools that you need now so that you can draw electron configurations and orbital diagrams on your own.